Hello, welcome or welcome back to Reads of an Apple. My name is Stacy. Cheese is over here. She's curled up sleeping. She was snoring earlier. Um, she'll probably wake up when she hears me like talking for a long sustained time and come over and yell at us. But anyway, we are here to wrap up August today and this will be a very quick wrap up compared to what I normally do. Um, I ran about half of what I typically do, if not less. And yeah, it's just been a slower month. Um, I don't think I have anything else to preface before we dive into things. So let's just jump into them. So for August, I read 11 books for a grand total of 2,763 pages. That's right only 11 books. Yeah, I averaged 3.27 days per book, which typically I'm in the like 0.5 to 1.5 range. And the average page count is 251.18. So I read a lot of short books and didn't read that many. For the page breakdown, my totals were I read one book that was under 100 pages two that were in the 100s, four in the 200s. Look, see, I told you. Hi. <laughs> Kisses from the kitty. Hi, honey. What are you doing? Oh. She's not loud. She's like doing, doing little Maui, very quiet sleep meows, huh? Hi. <laughs> Did mama come in to bother you? Um... Anyway, we had four books, four books, uh, in the 200s, two in the 300s, and another two in the 400s. You, good morning, Sleeping Beauty. You look a little bit uh, like a kitty wreck. Hi. Okay, um, I picked up five new to me authors. And I didn't have any rereads this month. <laughs> okay, on to graphic number two. For book clubs and read-alongs, I picked up two this month. Only two of my books had diversity, so <laughs> that's not good. Typically, I do better than that. Um, one of the books I read this month was a standalone, which is crazy. I typically don't read any standalones. Hi. What are you doing? You're just sitting here. Hi. Can I help you? Um, zero of the books I picked up were recommended to me. Two of these books I previously owned. I added three books to my wish list. I read one of these books physically. Eight of these I read via ebook. And two of these I read via audiobook. As for publishing, seven of these were indie published books and four of these were traditionally published. I just see her right here looking at me. You're distracting, you know that? Hi, you're even closer now? Um, the decades I read in were two in the 2000s, two in the 2010s, and seven that were published in the 2020s. As for the ages of our main characters, five of them I read were in their 20s. Um, I do think a couple of those, like one was in their 20s and one was in their 30s, but I just do like the youngest or whoever the main point of view is. Um, one of them, one of the books I read were characters in their 30s and five of them, at least one of them was a supernatural, immortal, long-lived kind of a situation. As for where these books were located, um, as of how I read them, uh, one of these books I physically owned. What are you doing? Can I help you? Um, three of these books were digitally owned. Four of these books I read in KU. And three of these books I checked out from Hoopla. 
Now my average rating for the month was 4.09. So still a decent reading month rating wise. I had one five star, which is surprising. I had three 4.5 stars. I had five four stars, one 3.5 star and one three star. One. Oh goodness. <laughs> And then the last stat I keep track of is genres. So I read two contemporaries, four fantasies, three historical romances, one paranormal romance, and one sci-fi romance. As for my contemporaries, I did break them down even farther. And one of them I'm calling an office, even though that's technically not really a sub-sub-genre that's more like a trope or a setting, but that's how I have it in my stats. I'll probably change that next year. But since I already have some others marked as office, I kept it. And then I have one other that is just a straight normal contemporary. So there we go. That's our stats. Very quick. Um, now, the first book I picked up during the month was Four Weddings to Fall in Love by Jackie Lau. This is a new release of hers that came out at the end of July. This is the start of her new series, Weddings with the Mocks. Uh, this is her indie published. Most of her books are indie published. Um, I gave this 4.5 stars. I really love this. This is Kim and Max. Um, they meet at a mutual best friend's uh, wedding. Um, Kim is a bridesmaid and uh, Max is good friends with the groomsmen. Um, they bump into each other. They have a one night stand that goes horrendously. And then they come to find out. Uh, so there's four weddings in this book. Uh, we have the first one. And then the other three are cousins of Max. However, Kim is good friends with one of his cousins and Kim's mother is good friends with Max's aunt. So Kim ends up and her and her parents end up getting invited to these other three weddings. And of course, Max is the cousin to the three people getting married to three of the people getting married. Um, Hi. And so he's there as well. And they just keep running into each other. And he is very like awkward and does better like this is his first first one night stand he does better in like a relationship and a long-term kind of deal where he can really get to know a person and know how like what kind of things like do's and don'ts basically of bedroom activities and they end up kind of have like agreeing to having a do-over and it just you know really builds on their relationship from them they kind of become friends a little bit or at least acquaintances um and have some good banter and then eventually they both give in go on a date and are quickly back in the bedroom this is probably the steamiest jackie lao book i have read there is a lot of steam in this almost a little too much for my my preference i would have wanted more of the emotional side but you know i just jackie lao is one of my favorite contemporary authors i loved i loved i love her writing style um you know we there isn't quite as much food content in this uh if you're a foodie if you love reading about food jackie lao has a lot of uh foodie stuff i definitely want to go to toronto and i wish that all of these places that our characters both own and go to in her book series are real because i would love to go there i actually for my birthday this year went to a cider bar um, as like, let's go to a cider bar. Um, but they ended up not having food there. So we ended up going to a cider bar and then a Mexican restaurant across the place. But I wanted to go to a cider bar because of her cider bar sister series. So, um, it heavily influenced by Jackie Lau. And I definitely want to try a lot of the food that she's talked about. If it's even real, I feel like it is. Um, but anyway, I just... I really enjoyed this series and the one half star drop is really because I wanted maybe one less or ha or maybe even just keep that steamy scene in there um, but just kind of not necessarily fade to back black but we don't need as much detail like kind of gloss over a little bit and then we could have put more to the emotional thing but 
super excited for the setup. He's got, uh, Max has three brothers who are going to be the other books in the series. And I'm just excited that Jackie Lau has finally come back with a new series. It's been a little bit since, uh, the last book in the Cider Bar Sisters came out and I'm ready to just kind of jump into new content from Jackie. So 4.5 stars. I know I've said that, but I just want to emphasize 4.5 stars. I love Jackie Lau. I'm so happy to have another one of her books in my life. Then I picked up the audiobook Hell on Earth. This is by Brenda K. Davies. This is the first book in her Hell on Earth series. This is technically a spinoff of a previous series, and the previous series focuses on one main couple, but we hardly even see them in this book. It totally read find as a, as a, like, standalone entering into the, a new series. I feel like I'm not really missing much by reading the other one. This premise is, the apocalypse has happened. Uh, gates to hell have opened up. Demons arrived on Earth um, 14 years ago? Over 10 years ago. Um, and it was pretty horrendous, the, the first little bit, um, because all of the demons who were kind of sealed away uh, in hell are like the bad demons were what broke out first. And then we have, um, different kinds of demons who have now kind of emerged from hell. Um, and they're kind of more like the guardian demons to kind of keep everything running smoothly. They're not necessarily evil. Um, they're just demonic creatures and, uh, they have been together with, um, different sects of humans. There are basically two, um, sex and they're becoming one. Um, we have, uh, the civvies or the people who live in the cities who work with the good demons, um, to try to kind of help save humanity, save earth and close these different portals and kill, um, the bad demons that have escaped through. Um, and then we have the wildlings, which are, basically humans that became survivalists, living in the woods, staying away from cities, um, tracking down demons in the forests, um, and just kind of, you know, living wild, as it suggests. Um, and then, uh, wildlings are slowly kind of being incorporated into, back into the cities as, um, more of the bad demons are being killed or sent back to hell and good demons are kind of coming more and more into power. And, um, Ren is the current leader of her little wildling group, and she is focusing on bringing this group into one of the local cities, and she is sent on a mission with other wildling fighters, and then a couple of the demons, um, and fallen angels, uh, and the leader guy is Ren, who is a demon, I can't remember what kind of demon they called him, but he's basically, like, think Tolkien elf style of demon. Um, and it is their love story. It is Faded Mates. There are some gruesome dark parts. I mean, we have flashbacks of uh, what Ren went through when the apocalypse first happened and the gruesome death of her mother and uh, neighbors. Um, there's a lot of death, a lot of killing. Most of it's demon on demon or humans on demon because they're killing the bad demons. But I thought this was super fun. I gave it four stars. I'm intrigued to read more. This gave me a little bit like if Buffy didn't save the universe kind of vibes, except it's more demon focused instead of just a multitude of monsters um, and with an emphasis on vampires, which is Buffy. But super interested. I listened to the audiobook. It was pretty great. So I definitely want to read more. This series does seem like each book will focus on a different care, uh, different, uh, pairing though, which is fun. Um, and that original series was like four or five books all with the same couple. So at some point I'll go back and read it, but I'm, I'm going to stick with this series, I think for now, but super fun to have a new series. Then I picked up In Which Margot Halifax Earns Her Shocking Reputation. This is the first book in the Halifax Hellions um, novella series by Alexandra Vasti. This is a free novella. The whole series is free. If you sign up for her newsletter, the third book actually just came out in this series. I gave this three stars. Um, 
it was a little too modern written for me. The characters were saying a little too modern colloquialisms. Um, I thought it was a little overly steamy for what I wanted um, in a novella. It definitely felt very physically based. I didn't really feel um, the emotional connection between Henry and Margot. This is a uh, class difference with Margot being of the ton. Um, brother's best friend, her uh, brother knew Henry. Um, Henry ended up going to the same like Oxford schooling system. Um, so she's apparently known him for a long time. Um, and Margot and her twin sister are basically known as the Halifax Hen Hellions in the ton. And they skew all uh, normal expectations that are expected in or expectations that are expected in society. And I thought that was a little too overdone. And I feel like if they really were that bad in society, they would be ruined. Like they would not be invited to any events. Like they, like, I just don't understand how they were still invited to places. Um, and it just felt too modern. Um, the way that they, the way that they talked was too modern. I know that consent was a thing, but they didn't talk about consent the same way that we talk about consent now. And so I was just like, this is not how they would be addressing the situation. Um, in that time period and it just really stood out to me and I'm not usually a stickler for historical accuracy it just it was too modern sounding and I just it killed my enjoyment so three stars but I'm definitely intrigued from what I can tell this is her first published book um but these are all like indie published through her website like I said but she does have a traditionally published novella or full-length book that is going to be traditionally published published that comes out in 2024 so we'll see um I might try it and see how it goes and if it's still that modern type feeling she just might not be a new histor newer historical author for me um, then we're going to quickly touch base on some of these. So here is where we start my 24 hour reading vlog where I read as many books as I could in 24 hours. Um, so the first book I picked up for that vlog was For Never by Aurora Rose Reynolds. This was the book for the Buzzing About Romance exclusive Patreon book club. Um, which was my first month participating in that. I had a lot, I had a blast. It was super fun. Um, but I talk about this book and I talk about the book club, my thoughts on the book club and how welcoming and fun, how much fun I had for, during it, during the vlog, like I said. Um, and I'll just do a rough, uh, just kind of brief overview. I gave this book four stars. This was a uh, fake engagement with a temporary, uh, secretary. Um, he is a millionaire, if not billionaire, of a gaming company who used to be a famous uh, gamer on YouTube um, before he even went to college kind of a thing. Um, and then he needs a fake engagement for a fake girlfriend, which is really a fake engagement or fiance, I guess, for a big family reunion. Um, definitely summer vibes. It's like 250-ish pages, so it was pretty quick. I had a lot of fun with it. So four stars for my full thoughts. Go check out that reading vlog. Then I picked up the audiobook The Charm School by Susan Wiggs. Um, this is the first book in her Calhoun Chronicles series. I gave this 3.5 stars. This is America Western... Um, western side of the planet <laughs> um set uh we have uh our heroine isadora is from a boston family she's kind of the black sheep of the family she's not as pretty as everybody else she's more uh normal looking i guess <laughs> Um, she's super into books. She's very much into learning languages and wants to explore the world. And she ends up finagling her way onto a pirate ship that, or not a pirate ship, um, like a trade ship. 
They turn pirates at the end, though. So it turns into a pirate ship, but it's not just a pirate ship. Um, but she joins them when they're on um, a trade route to do kind of imports, exports down to, if I remember correctly, Costa Rica or somewhere in South America. Um, and she finagles her way on the ship as a translator. And it is her romance with Ryan, who is the captain of the boat. So 3.5 stars. I listened to it via audio book. It was good. There was a lot of slave talk about slavery. Um, I feel like the author definitely tried to say how bad slavery was, but that our main characters were against slavery. Um, Ryan was the best friend with um, the slave boy that was given to him by his father when he was little and, as soon, and he decided to go to uh, college um, in New York, I think, or just up north. And as soon as they crossed that line, uh, the Mason-Dixie line, I think is the line it was, um, he set him free. And now they're doing all these quick jobs so they can earn enough money that he, uh, Ryan can buy and then set free um, his man's uh, wife and two children. Um, so there is a lot of slavery talk our characters morally are trying to be on the right side um but i just some of it felt weird to me um and i don't feel like i can fully have a good opinion on how it was necessarily portrayed or handled um i liked that there was no like trying to ignore the fact that their families earned the money that they had on slavery, but they're now uh, trying to step away from that and fight for Africans' rights. But some of, there were times where I was just like, oh, that didn't feel good to me. So I gave it 3.5 stars. This is an early 2000s book. There wasn't really any consent issues here. So um, for early historicals, that wasn't really a thing. But I'm going to stop talking about it now. Like I said, I read this during the vlog. So watch that. Also read during the vlog my first and only physical read, but the first the first of two that I do own physically, I read On the Edge uh, by Alona Andrews. This is the first book in their Edge series. I read this for the next uh, book in the Alona Andrews read-along. As you can tell, we are now starting the Edge series. I give this 4.5 stars. This is a completely new world. It does connect with their Innkeeper Chronicles series, but you know, new setup. Uh, I gave it 4.5 stars because it was a little clunky in the beginning. This is one of their earlier published books, but I still had a lot of fun with this book and I cannot wait to see what we do more. Uh, paranormal. Uh, well, actually, I consider this more of a fantasy book, like urban fantasy or just straight fantasy. This series is different in the fact that these are all standalone romances in an interconnected series, which is unique from Alona Andrews. So, excited to read more. Also included in my 24-hour vlog, I finally picked up Resisting Maxu by Victoria Aveline. This is the sixth book in her Cl Clocanian series. Book seven just dropped, Ruling Sixth Land. I cannot wait to read it. I have the arc, um, so I need to get to it. I gave this 4.5 stars. Another great entry, another gorgeous cover and back cover in the series. And I had a lot of fun. This is Maxu and Meg's book. Uh, the biggest selling point for this book was that uh, Meg and a group of humans basically are touring Clacania um, and kind of introducing some of the different cities who haven't met the humans or even seen the humans yet get to see them. And so we get introduced to a lot of new countries. Uh, countries, cities, uh, continents, areas in Clacania, um, and the various cultures that are there. So I thought this book was super fun. Like I said, 4.5 stars and check out my reading vlog to see more. So those are the two physical books I have to show you. Um, then I picked up Luna Cursed by Alessa Thorne. This is my one five star for the month. 
if you are not surprised, it's Zoralasa Thorn. This is the fourth and final book in her Ironwood series, which spun off of the Wrath of the Fae series, which has a spinoff, the Lost Fae King series, and there are more spinoffs planned in the future. This is Ciara in Tor's book. She is Ciara the Wolf Slayer, and she is paired with Tor, basically the alpha of the Viking werewolves in this world. I thought it was super fun. We kill the last general from Morrigan. There is a teaser in the epilogue for a spinoff series that I cannot wait that is not the next one planned. Um that may or may not have something to do with Fenris and a fated mate for him. So super excited to read more from Alessa Thorne. This is also in the 24 hour vlog. Then the final book that I have in the 24 hour vlog is Dance of the Forest King. After finishing Luna Cursed, I had to pick up the first book in the next spinoff series. Like I said, Lost Fay Kings. This is book one. This is Chrissy and Oberon. And uh, these are like her fae daddies. These are the uncle to the three brothers in the original Wrath of the Fae series. And Chrissy is the best friend of our heroine from book one, Elise. And I was thinking when I read the first book, Chrissy would be book two. But Chrissy wasn't. Chrissy was just the side character. But now Chrissy has her HEA. Uh, Chrissy is... Uh, West Indies African, I believe, and she is super into magic. Um, I gave this four stars. It was really good. You could tell that it was shorter. It was like 20, 30-ish pages shorter than Alessa Thorne's other books, um, and I had a little bit of, con of contention with um, Oberon pushing Chrissy away because of their age gap. Um, this is, I mean, all Fae books I feel like are an age gap, but this is even more because these are like the uncle daddy type Fae. Um, so that's <laughs> even more age gap compared to the first three books, but still four stars. I still loved it. I love seeing all of our side characters from the previous books and side characters that we know are going to get books in the future. And it was a lot of fun. Four stars. Okay, so two more books to talk about. The 10th book I picked up in the month was Dear Julia by Romy Summer. This is the first book in her Roaring Twenties romance series. This is a 1920s based book um, or set book. However, it is in England. So we don't get the typical like Roaring Twenties vibe that we would from like uh, America set Roaring Twenties books. Um, and it's all set in the countryside. But this I thought was super cute. This is um, Rosalie. She and her father have just moved to the country from London. And Rosalie is working on like renovating and redoing the house for her father. And when they pull back the mantle for the fireplace, she finds a letter that was never delivered to a lady named Julia. Come to find out, it is the previous owner's daughter. And um, it was a letter from William, a local commander who was in the war and before he left for the war in 18, uh, I think 1817, um, he had written a letter proposing to Julia. There's also a ring in the letter. And when the letter um, is found, Julia kind of uses the gossip line in town to find where uh, or who the letter is from, and she returns it to William, and then she's super intrigued by this reclusive war veteran who is living in this gorgeous house, but does not enter their local society at all, and she just kind of worms her way into becoming his friend, and then wants to matchmake him with a lovely single lady in town, and ends up falling in love with him herself. So I gave this four stars. It was super cute. It was like 101 pages, very quick read. Um, I love the vibes. I liked the mix of her being a little more independent and those modern sensibilities, um, but with some of the Regency vibes. And this kind of, this works for me though, because it's set in the 1920s where it feels 
more natural for the women to be really pushing to be independent and, you know, not have to necessarily be a virgin when they get married and um, not have to always have a chaperone kind of a thing, although it's still a safety issue. But still, it's I, I enjoyed the more modern sensibilities mixed in with the historical here. I feel like it fits this time frame. Um, way, way better. I really enjoyed it. Four stars. Um, it was 99 cents on Amazon. I used some of my ship my items later for extra digital credits, uh, money on it. So it was pretty much free for me. And I'm definitely intrigued to read more in this series. I think if you're looking for a fun historical novella, this is one of the better ones that I've read in quite a while now. So I, I highly recommend this, especially if you're wanting something 1920s set. Then the final book I picked up for the month was uh, the uh, manga, formerly The Fallen Daughter of the Duke. Now this is um, a manga that is being redone from a web no novel of the same name. Um, now, the web novel is created by, let me I zoom in here so I can make sure I say the names properly. Um, so, the author of the story is um, Ichibu Saki, so she wrote the web novel. Um, and then the manga is illustrated by uh, Shiratori Ushio. Um, I have not read um, from either of these, or no, that's not right. I have not read anything by Ichibu Saki before, but I have heard of the web novel of the same name. Um, I did see that I have read um, some uh, mangas that were uh, illustrated before. Um, by uh, Ushio. But I gave this four stars. I enjoyed this. Um, this kind of has a similar premise I've been seeing kind of a lot lately when I was into uh, web novels. Um, I feel like it's a common kind of trope in the past couple of years, especially on like the web novels when you're looking at the fantasy historical elements of books. Um, this is a fell into an otome game. Um, which, if you didn't know, those are like the love story, uh, novel, simulator kind of um, games. They're very, very popular in Japan more and more. Um, you'll see them being translated and coming into America. But I feel like it's still not a, not as big of a genre as it is um, in Japan, for sure. Um, so this one is... Claire is our, is our main heroine, and um, we don't realize this at first, but there are a couple scenes that we see of her coming back into the real, real world, so to speak, but she is um, the eldest daughter of a duke um, in this system, or in this magic world. Uh, magic is passed through the uh, mother's line, um, and when you are 15, you go through your magic initiation and you enter um, a holy fountain or water um, in a church uh, in the homeland of your mother. And then the spirits reflect um, the color of the amount of power you have. So your strength level is determined um, or is displayed by the color of your magic. Um, white and like silver are the top two. Um, when it is time for Claire to do this initiation, hers comes out light pink, which is like in the middle of the power. But her mother and her grandmother both had white and silver. So when this happens, um, she's she's basically seen as the heir of magic. Uh, her father and her brothers kind of practically disown her without actually disowning her. She is bullied. She's not treated well. She is definitely now less than. Um, at some point before her initiation, um, her, because Claire's mother had died. 
Um, her younger sister, Charlotte, is a half-sister. She's the daughter of um, their father's mistress. And when she dies, uh, her father uh, takes Charlotte. Charlotte in um, to live with the family and Claire was very happy. She was more, she was like so happy to have a sister um, and help protect her and just do you know sisterly things because she was originally just had brothers before then. Um, and when it is time for her sister to be initiated her magic is white. So when that happens Things really hit the fan for Claire, and she not only is having her uh, arranged engagement to the crown prince of their country annulled or canceled, um, and it being now switched over to Charlotte, but we find out that Charlotte has been playing the victim and acting like Claire has been bullying her, treating her wrongly, uh, forcing her to do things that she doesn't want to do, being abusive. Um, and so the friends that Claire had that managed to stick around after her power wasn't as strong as people were expecting of her, of her line. Um, now have basically given up on her because she's been this horrible sister and treating her like almost kind of like reverse Cinderella type things. So it's like she's the evil stepsister, half sister kind of a thing. Um, and she decides instead of waiting for her family to kind of kick her out or leave her, you know, left for dead kind of a situation, she is going to run away and join a convent. And because at least then her mid-level magic will still be useful to someone. Um, while she is in the process of heading to the convent, she runs into Vic and uh, three of his friends. It is Keith, Dennis, and Louis. Louis is actually a woman who is disguised as a male, like, knight kind of situation. And they befriend Claire um, when they see she's traveling alone because she's this cute little young woman who is not safe for her to be alone. Um... And they kind of convince her to, instead of going to the convent, to join them um, traveling back to their home, which is a different country. And if she decides she doesn't want to stay there, um, they'll then, you know, escort her safely to a convent where she would like to be. But they want to give her basically a chance in a new life kind of a situation. When we arrive to the new country, we find out that Vic is the crown prince for this other country, which is crazy. But another fun thing that happens while they're traveling is they uh, stop at this um, small country that used to be um, like a big country in power. And then there was a war or they were taken over or something. But uh, this country basically was absolved into um, being run by other people and the royal family of this uh, previous country. I can't remember what it's called. It starts with an L. Um, but basically there's no survivors or anything. Well, um, when they stop to where there used to be a church, but it has since been like, uh, raised to the ground. Um, there is now an area where the magical, like holy fountain used to be where the ocean comes in and like, it's like a kind of little bay area or maybe more like a cove, but, uh, Claire has never been to the ocean, so when she steps into the water, craziness happens because it turns out her mother's actual, like, land of birth is this country. Um, and magic lights appear, and it is, like, Aurora-esque. And no one has ever seen magic like that before. Some of them don't even realize it's, like, the magic, like, if she was be being initiated kind of thing. Um... And everyone is just like, oh, uh, what's happening? Um, Claire passes out from the, the, like, sudden rush of overwhelmingly powerful magic. No one has seen that color of magic before. Um, so she is super duper strong in magic. But when she finds her way uh, with everybody back to this other country, um, she needs a job. And so she's going to become a governess. Um, and then Vic approaches her and is like, you know, 
you have magic that we've never seen before so it'd be great if you could go to like the royal school here because we're friends and I'm in my last year at this royal academy and so you would at least have one friend there. So that's how kind of things end up. I'm super intrigued to read more. I thought it was super cute. I gave it four stars. The artwork is gorgeous. And yeah, I'm excited to read more and to see more um, of like how the real life is going to be playing into if we'll get more in the real life or if Claire is just going to live her life in this. What I find super duper interesting is she's not really villainous necessarily, although it could be maybe in the original game. Game, the Claire char character was more villainous but when Claire enters back into the real world and she's talking to her friend who was like playing this Otome game um she's playing as Charlotte like Charlotte is who you play as in this game and she's kind of giving things and subconsciously they'll pop up when Claire is in the magic world but you play as Charlotte and the hardest route to get to the uh, happy ending with the original crown prince, not Vic, um, is you have to do this weird thing where you have to get close to one of the brothers and then convince the brothers to dispose of this letter or get access to a vault. And when in the vault is this letter that explains where Claire is supposed to take her initiation, that it's not where... Um, people think their mother <laughs> was actually raised. Um, and then you have to like do like skeevy things to then kind of get Claire kicked out and she goes missing and then you're able to have your happy ending with the crown prince kind of a thing. So it's interesting that she's kind of almost in not necessarily the villainous role, but she's entering in as the secondary character who kind of gets the crap stick <laughs> in this uh, like love story route that you're supposed to play. So I haven't seen a premise or the storyline like that. I haven't read very many, but I've seen a lot of them that are you enter in as the villain, villainess, or you enter in as the main character, but not necessarily like a side character who kind of is made out to be somewhat of a villain, but it's not like a bad villain that you like have to fight through the entire time or is like constantly like at odds with you for getting the HEA situation. So I don't know. I'm very intrigued to read more and see what is going to happen. Um, but yeah, that's book 11. And that's what we have. I'm surprised that this is still 40 minutes long for how little I read. But, you know, some of these books I definitely talked more about and the other ones I talked more than I expected to. <laughs> but like I said, if you want more information on the middle six books that I read, definitely check out the vlog I had linked above. Um, actually, now that I say this, I don't think the vlog is out when this comes out yet. So check out the vlog when it is posted. I will have it linked above. It should come out sometime in the next week if I remember correctly what I have set in my planner, but some point, sometime soon my 24-hour reading vlog will be out and I will discuss all those books in a lot more depth. So let me know what your favorite books of August were, if there are any on here you're super interested in, or if there's any new releases from August that you got to that you were super into, let me know. I'd love to add more books to my TBR because why not? Um, if you'd like to just leave me an emoji, leave me something artistic since the last book I read was a manga. So like a paintbrush, a drawing pen, something fun like that, a palette, like a paint palette, something fun. Um, but otherwise, I think that's all I have for you today. So don't forget to like and subscribe and I will see you soon with another video.